I first wrote a book uh, titled Sawdust Empire about uh, the timber industry in Everett. And the gentleman that helped me, uh, David Delgard, at the, uh, he was an Everett uh, historian and worked up at the library, uh, he, uh, he suggested to me uh, to write about French Peter, the original homesteader of Hat Island and uh, one of the very first uh, white settlers in Snohomish County. And he was part of a, uh, uh, the, the first set settlement out at Tulalip Bay. Him and uh, three other gentlemen built a sawmill out there. And um, after uh, David suggested that I, 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 I take on French Peter, I started to research him and I, I found him to be fascinating. Um, David, uh, back about 30 years ago, he, he uh, put out this book uh, uh, of uh, titled Dark Deeds and he, he talks about three different murders in Snohomish County back in the 1860s, 1870s. And, and one of the stories in here is Gutre's Gold and uh, David kind of outlines uh, Peter Gutre's life. Um, and so I use this as a compass uh, for my publication, uh, French Peter, uh, Journey to Hat Island. We do know that uh, he, uh, Peter Gutre is in the history books uh, of Snohomish County. Uh, he and those gentlemen, they started that sawmill uh, in 1853. Uh, we do know that uh, Peter Gutre was uh, worked was an employee for the Hudson's Bay Company, and he was at uh, Fort Nisqually, and and he was in these parts in the early 1840s, and and uh, he was a French Canadian by birth, and he came out on the uh, the Express, and the, which was their overland express that the Hudson Bay Company used from Hudson Bay in Manitoba all the way out here to the Pacific Coast, and they used they traveled by foot and by canoe. Uh, but uh, that's how uh, Peter Gutre got out here, and he landed at uh, Tulalip Bay in uh, 1853 and partnered up with those gentlemen, and it was the first uh, sawmill in the county. In 1855, when the uh, Point Elliott Treaty was signed, it designated the Tulalip Bay as the location for the uh, reservation for the local tribes. The local tribes were the Snohomish Indians, and the Skykomish Indians. Uh, I think some of the Snoqualmie tribe was also part of that. But um, so Peter was uh, had to had to leave, and the uh, government actually paid him two thousand uh, dollars to pull up stakes and uh, leave his homestead. He had homesteaded one hundred and sixty acres out there um, of uh, of land, along with his partner John Gould. He also had a homestead. Uh, claim there, and they they used timber from those claims to um, you know mill in their in their sawmill, but um, uh, Tulalip is just a name. There are no Tulalip Indians per se. Um, it is made up of the Snohomish Indians mostly. Um, but uh, Peter uh, from Tulalip he went out to Hat Island and he homesteaded there on the northern uh, half of the island, and he lived somewhat of a peaceful life uh, there for about the next 15 years. Uh, when he first went out there, he had to paddle north to Coopville if he wanted flour, sugar, salt, coffee, whiskey, all of his, kind, all of his uh, you know, supplies. Uh, but in 1861, um, uh, Frost and Fowler, uh, Jacob uh, Fowler and uh, uh, Mr. Frost, they started the trading post at Muncletillo. And so Peter was able to uh, travel a much shorter distance for his supplies. Um, but he lived out on the island with his dog, John. I used the dark deeds for my compass. And in the, in the article, Gutre's Gold in Dark Deeds, David Dilgard posed a number of questions of, of why, uh, why Peter Gutre decided to settle at Tulalip and claim uh, the land he did because the land he claimed was the ancient Indian burial grounds uh, for the Snohomish Indians. And so that was a pretty big head scratcher as to why would somebody do that? And um, I tried to answer that question and many other questions uh, of how the, the gentlemen came together uh, because those little particulars aren't in the history books. Uh, that, that early publication 
that William Whitfield, uh, the history of Snohomish County that he published in, I believe, 1925, doesn't get into the real close details and particulars of how that group of men came together. It's just, it's just stated. And so um, I created uh, those partnerships kind of on my own. And, and that's where the fictional side of historical fiction comes in. Um, I, my book deals with um, real people, real events, um, but I had to create a story around all of those real people and real events uh, to, to make an adventure story, because um, that's what it is. It's, a, it's an old time adventure story. Peter was found in 1875. He was discovered on the beach, uh, dead out at Hat Island. And his dog, John, was there at his side, still protecting him. And Peter had a um, apple orchard up on the top of Hat Island. And he would sell his apples. He would bring them to market. He would bring them into Uncle Teal. And, um, and he had buyers for those things. And, and he had a particular buyer in 1875 that was going to buy uh, his crop. But Peter didn't show up, and he didn't show up. And so finally, uh, two uh, canoes of uh, four gentlemen uh, paddled out to Hat and discovered his body on the beach. And uh, it was an unsolved mystery and murder as to what happened to Peter Goutre out on Hat Island. Um, they buried him, and he is still buried there today. Uh, close to the marina and close to the clubhouse that exists there on Hat Island now. The beauty in historical fiction is that the story is, is there already. Um, we know that the um, primary real-life actors, uh, we know a little bit about their background, what they do, what occurred, um, but we don't have the actual action and the dialogue. And so that's what I really enjoy doing with, with the historical fiction is, is creating that real inside story of, of letting the reader be there and be with those characters and, and learn about all those things from 150 years ago that you may not have known before. Um, we do know that um, Peter was an H uh, Hudson Bay employee. And we also know that he worked on the tall ships for a number of years. And when Peter comes back after 10 years at sea, he lands at uh, Fort Victoria. Um, previous to that, he was, I, I have Peter up at Fort Stikine, which was a very northern outpost of the Hudson Bay Company in what was called then uh, uh, Russia. Uh, it was Russian territory, and um, Fort Stikine was near what is now known as uh, uh, Wrangell, Alaska. And, um, but in any event, I'm going to read a passage of uh, when Peter first uh, arrives uh, in northern Puget Sound, and he had paddled from, from uh, Fort Victoria. He had loaded his canoe with all of his supplies he would need for his new life, he had, he had saved up his money as a seafaring man, and uh, he spent a good bulk of it at, at, at Fort Victoria, at the Hudson's Bay store there that was um, quite, uh, you know, it was the main trading post for that, that area up there. But uh, Peter uh, uh, had lost his wife when he first left Fort Stikine, and he had married uh, a uh, Indian woman. And so I'm going to read a portion of when, uh, when Peter first comes to northern Puget Sound. And this is when, uh, after he's left uh, Fort Victoria, he spent the night at Bowman Bay, uh, which is just north of what is uh, present-day Deception Pass State Park. Peter woke to a stellar blue sky the next day. And while the tide was still ebbing, he readied his canoe, then stood and looked out over the strait. A river of salt water could clearly be seen streaming out from the narrow pass and into the greater calm of the bay, like a vein of flowing life. As the strait welcomed the flowing tide, 
He could see the immense body of water heave and sway, the low rolling swells moving to and fro. It was in that trice of time when he saw the sound as a living, breathing entity, full of vitality, its rhythmic pattern of life in constant motion. He relished in the moment until the, until the tide slowed and ultimately ceased. Smiling, Peter pushed off his canoe and began to paddle in earnest. He hugged the northern shoreline, traveling past rocky outcroppings, tide pools, and small inlets. Around the corner of a point, he came into the sight of an island on the left side of the pass, a granite pillar of solid rock carved thousands of years ago by retreating glaciers. It jutted 200 feet straight up with a slender passage between it and the north side. He headed towards it. As Peter approached the western portal, the quietness of the day came over him. He stopped paddling and floated on the calm, slack water for a while with only the faint sound of water dripping from the end of his, of, of his paddle blade to accompany him. Gazing up at the time-weathered rock walls, Peter felt like he was traveling through a secret passageway to his future. But it reminded him of his past, sitting in the cathedral of the old stone church in Montreal with his mother and father on Sundays, praying and singing hymns. A rush of emotion surged through him. His body tingled with spirituality. Time and tide had stopped, and the world was all his in a life-affirming moment. Basking in the glory and the beauty of the wilderness, the miracle of God's creation touched his soul. Peter reached down outside of his canoe and brushed the cold, salty water with his fingers, brought the moisture up to his face and rubbed his forehead, then crossed himself, anointing himself with the sailing waters of Puget Sound. Elation moved through his system. He let his body fall backwards against the stern, then looked up at the brilliant cobalt sky and reveled in the experience. A moment later, the incoming current turned the thin channel into a liquid conduit of rushing waves. The rapids in his paddling pushed his 20-foot canoe through the canyon-walled notch and out the other end. He emerged from the eastern portal of the waterway where it turned south and widened into a hidden inland saltwater sea. The warm sun shone down on Peter. To the northeast, a bulging volcano-shaped mountain covered in snow and glaciers stood out on the horizon. He stopped paddling and drifted with the fast-moving current on a golden day in a golden land. Three deer were on the shore of a close-in beach taking in the sunshine, and above them, a bald eagle stood guard, perched in an old-growth snag, while a red-tailed hawk circled above. The unspoiled world lay wild and free before him. He felt like an argonaut that had just found the golden fleece in a wide open pristine land that was all there for him. He then looked at the empty seat in front of the canoe and his mood instantly swung to melancholy. Little rain should be here. Dear God, I wish she was here. I'm so sorry. I never should have taken her away from her family. It's all my fault she's gone. Please, God, forgive me. Peter paddled on easily, slowly, the joy of the world around him tempered by his memories. He was surrounded by resplendence the likes of few breathing men, white men had ever seen. But the pain of Little Rain's loss bore down on him with the weight of him still being alive. He knew he'd be burdened with it with, for the rest of his days, gnawing away at him causing despair. Peter reached forward and grabbed a bottle of rum, pulled the cork and drank deeply. For the rest of the day, he rode the incoming tide, most of the time using his paddle as a rudder and letting the water push him along. When he came to the edge of a wide, deep bay, he decided to make camp on the eastern shore of Woodby Island. And so, uh, that would have been at Oak Harbor, where Peter stopped and spent the night. And in the morning, he, uh, he heads farther south, and he finds Penn Cove. And he gets to meet John Alexander and his, and his wife, Frances, and Benjamin Barstow, 
who uh, had the, the trading post there at Penn Cove. And uh, they invite him to stay for lunch, and, and he, he does that, and they, they chat and kind of g teach him the ropes of how to go about homesteading land and what he needs to do and, and the process that he has to, has to go through to, to do that kind of a thing. And, and, and of course, in the book, as Peter is working his way south through that upper part of Puget Sound, he's looking for streams coming off of hills because he had gotten the idea of building a sawmill when he was at Fort Victoria. And at that time, Fort Victoria had uh, three sawmills going. And he had, he had stayed there a week after getting off the tall ship. Um, he had to uh, trade for a canoe. He had to buy his supplies, but also he walked around the settlement and he, he saw uh, one uh, uh, sawmill that was being powered uh, by water power that was uh, pushing uh, you know, a, uh, the, the mechanics of, of a sawmill. So he's got this idea in his head that, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to do when I come here to this new world. And uh, so... So the story of French Peter is an unsolved murder. Yes. One of the first in Snohomish One of the very first. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I first started researching Peter, well, I, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to solve his murder. Um, because um, in my research, I found a Everett Har Herald article from 1938 where... Um, uh, I think her first name was Louise, but it was Louise Fowler. She was the first white child to be born in Snohomish County at Uncle Teo. She was uh, Jacob Fowler's daughter. And um, anyway, in her elder years, um, she had given an interview with uh, the Everett Herald. And in it, uh, they, they brought up uh, French Peter, Peter Goutre, and because uh, she knew him. He came down to Uncle Teo for supplies. Uh, sometimes he would actually spend the night um, and paddle back the next day. Sometimes he would just come, get supplies, and go. But uh, she, she, she did meet Peter Goutre. and But in her interview, she, uh, they brought him up, and she uh, uh, claimed that it was uh, two Indians from Tulalip that had paddled out and murdered him for his money. Uh, you know, everybody knew that he had been paid off by the government when uh, the treaty was signed and the government paid him $2,000. There was also rumors that he had gold from, uh, gold buried uh, from his days being a, a French seaman on the tall ships. And so, um, and that was, that was the last narrative that was um, kind of left there uh, for the public uh, and um, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to change that. And I know that he was an, an employee of the Hudson's Bay Company. And so I weaved a story um, placing uh, Peter up at Fort Stikine and um, coming down here to Puget Sound. Um, and the story is done in three different parts. Um, and uh, once he lands at uh, Tulalip Bay, all of the characters are real life people. Um, I just put their stories to dialogue and to action. French Peter, uh, Journey to Hat Island is a adventure story. And I truly enjoyed uh, researching it and writing it. My other two books, uh, The Pride of Monte Cristo um, and Sawdust Empire, were both uh, works of historical fiction. Uh, all, and all of them, they all deal with real events, real people. I do add in some fictional characters. All my stories do have a few fictional characters to kind of liven up the story, uh, give it a few more dynamics and what have you. But basically, um, they are real life events with real people. <laughs>